Hey, First Wednesday is coming, 7 o'clock Wednesday night. You're going to want to be here because... You know what, what the Holy Ghost, the Holy Go Ghost just pours out fire on the altar, but sometimes you need to f come with a little bit of gasoline in the tank. And uh, it's going to be incredible. You know what God is going to do this Wednesday? The Holy Spirit showed me that he wants to do some family healing out there. That doesn't mean like, I don't know what your family situation is like, because even this sermon series is, is all about relationships. And, and so the Holy Spirit is going to fix something that either happened in family or something that's going to happen in family. How many people know that when the Holy Ghost does it, when he fixes something, it stays fixed. And, and some of us, we, we, we got through the past, but that's why we have freedom group for you. So it's not just enough to get past your past. You got to go through it. And when you go back through it with God there, you'll realize like, oh, God was there. Oh, and then God starts to, and there's going to be a family healing time on Wednesday night. It's going to be incredible. I don't even know what I'm preaching yet because the Holy Spirit hasn't given it to me. So if you're curious, why don't you come out and see? Could be a horrible train wreck too, which is most of what Venue Church does. You just can't keep your eyes off it. It's like watching a train wreck, like here it goes. <laughs> I told somebody this morning, I'm like, you know, I love Venue. I never know what's going to happen. And I'm the pastor. So, I mean, isn't that good? You don't need to go to a church and like every Sunday is going to be the same thing. You're just going to be like, and pastor's going to say something. I'm going to talk to you. Uh, today's sermon is called Thou Shalt Not. I'm going to start this series, and Pastor Erin is going to, I'm going to hand it off to her next weekend. She's going to preach on Mother's Day. Man, Mother's Day, moms, you need to be like, you need to tell everybody, moms, like, don't you dare. Yeah, breakfast in bed. You make me breakfast in bed, but I'm going to church, and my family's going to church, because that's the best Mother's Day gift you can give me, going to church with your family. And... Um, it's going to be powerful. She has a sermon called um, Window Watching, which sounds creepy. And I'm like, that'll do for a sermon title. I'm in. And um, it's going to be powerful. She's been running some of her ideas past me, though, what the Holy Spirit's been showing her. Not every rule that you have in a family or in a relationship can have the equal amount of weight. Sometimes we, like, make rules up in the home. Sean knows this. He has too many girls. I have too many girls. I have more girls than Sean did. They just, their hearts were coward cowardly and they just stopped one shy of perfection for girls <laughs> but look like whether you put the socks in the underwear drawer it's a rule but you know it's it's like not the most important there are some rules that have to matter more and have to weigh more and today i'm going to be talking about not the second rule in the home growing up in which was thou shalt not talk back to mother in fact she can yell at you because that's how she expresses herself and you probably deserve it Corey. but if you ever Raise your voice to your mother. You can move down the street to the house where that's what they do. But around here, if you want to eat and live indoors, you will respect thy mother. Ready for rule number one? The foundation of any relationship is the truth. The truth. We're not thinking about truth the way that it is. We're thinking about the way that we would like it to be. Which means like Dustin comes to me and he's in my small group. I'm trying to get him to join somebody else's small group. I'm just kidding. I love you, man. I just, why do I have to say stuff like that? It's so hurtful and funny. You know, but Dustin's like, he's hearing the word morality thrown a lot. He's in the oil and gas sector. And he's like, everybody's saying like morality, morality, truth, truth. But I don't know how, the truth is not something you put in your pocket and carry around with you and take it out when you want to win an argument. The truth is something that puts you in its pocket and carries you around. And tells you what to do. And when, when the relationship in your life, when the relationships are built on the truth, they will succeed and they will prosper. The truth sets you free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then you're like, well, and then we do it like this. Well, you know, Carmen, she's got her own truth. And, I, and Carmen's like, well, pastor, that might be your truth, but this is my truth. What she really means is this is my experience. But look, truth is truth. And if truth is truth, then it works for Carmen and it works for me. The same truth. There's not 50 million truths out there. There are a few. And the truth of the gospel can set you free that sin is a problem. But you know, sin is, is not the problem in a home. Thank you, Sean. I'll keep you up here all day. I kind of like it. Truth is not the problem in Sean's, or not truth. Uh, the, uh, sin is not really the issue in their marriage, in their home. Truth is the issue. Because didn't Jesus come to do away with sin? So sin is not really the issue. Now, sin hurts and I get that but 
As far as the east is from the west, God can remove your sin from you. you know, the blood of the cross on the cross is much greater than any sin that has ever been committed. It can forgive anything. And that's not really the issue. The issue has to do in and around the truth. And so the commandment number one that I grew up with in my home that hopefully we are passing to our kids is this one. Thou shalt not tell a lie. Lying is the worst thing you can do in a home. Lying is the worst thing you can do anywhere because lying covers sin. And when you think about your life, how important is the truth to you? Because people lie all the time right now. You know, nobody makes a sitcom, you know, like Modern Family. Not that I watch that unless you think it's funny. Then I watch it a little and I just forward the bad parts. <laughs> Thanks for being honest, Pastor. We appreciate a pastor who's honest. It's no problem. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story for, painful from my life about how I wasn't always honest. And so, but, you know, nobody makes a sitcom of a family that tells the truth all the time. Who broke this? It was me. I'm an idiot. Yeah. You know, like, end of show. <laughs> no, they start with these lies, and then they kind of get, then they get worse and worse, and then it becomes these elaborate stories where everybody's kind of, but then at the end, everybody's getting along, and they're like, I'm sorry. You know, I guess I told you the lie because meh, 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 meh. it makes good television, right? But in normal families, after you lie a whole bunch, then, uh, then uh, things get worse and worse and worse, like in real life. Can we separate TV from real life? It's just you wouldn't make a TV show about it. You ready? The worst thing you can do is tell a lie. Lying breaks relationship. Every time that I tell a lie, it breaks relationship. Every time I tell you a lie, it breaks a relationship. Every time you tell me a lie, it breaks our relationship. Lying is the worst thing that you can do. If you're going to set a family up or a relationship up, what matters is the truth. In fact, the truth is the only thing that matters. All the other rules, you know, we have a rule in Canada right now that means more to us than thou shalt not tell a lie. It's thou shalt not be perceived as being mean. But how many people know that? Has anybody ever told you the truth about you? And they're like, you're, an ac you're actually a jerk. And you're like, thank you. That was the kindest and the nicest thing. I so you are the nicest person in the world. No, because the truth always hurts when you're a jerk. Always be yourself unless you suck, then stop. <laughs> this is going to go off the reservation today. So the worst thing you can do is tell a lie. Lying breaks relationships. C.S. Lewis says the first prayer in front of every other prayer is, may it be the real me who speaks. Well, you're like, well, he didn't sound like he trusted himself. Of course he didn't. That's why he was so smart. He didn't trust himself because he's like, there are situations that I'm not the real me. And if it's not the real me, the next thing is like, it may be the real me that speaks in the real you, God, that I'm speaking to. Because if it's not the real me, who am I talking to? And, um, and, and how does this look in family? So I'm going to just tell you that it works in every relationship. Every relationship is based on the truth. And how well the relationship does is how much truth is in the relationship. And so... Um, but I'll bet you a hundred bucks that during this week, you were set up in a place where you didn't tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help you God. Look, I know that this is a, how does pastor know these things? Because what do you think I've been dealing with in my own life? God re has to reveal it to you. The only way he can reveal it to you is to show you, shine a light on it and be like, see, you don't respond to this all the time. That's right. You see, there's an actual problem, but God never reveals what he doesn't want to heal. And so hang on to it. It's going to be a word of God for you. Somebody wore a Pinocchio shirt. I've never seen one of those in church before in the first service. And I'm like, Amense, how did you know? The spirit of prophecy. Thou shalt never tell a lie. This is, do you guys want to hear about, um, it's just human nature. How do you go from being 100% right to 100% wrong in one millisecond? Do you want to hear about how Pastor Aaron and I argue and fight with each other? You're going to be like, you shouldn't be pastor after you tell this story. I'm like, whatever. I started the church. You can't kick me out. So... <laughs> This is, what, this is how every argument goes. Like, I'll be, we'll be watching a movie and I'll be like, I feel like, yeah, Tom Cruise is in this. He's also in this movie. And Pastor Aaron will be like, no, he's not. And I'll be like, yes, he is. Then I get all saucy. I'm like, yeah, he is. 100%. Anybody watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine? A thousand push-ups. A thousand push-ups. I'm that sure. I will bet you a thousand push-ups that I am right and that you are wrong. I'm like, no, he's absolutely 100%. He's in that movie. And she's like, no, he's not. I'll be like, yeah, he is. And then what happens next is psychological warfare. If you've never been in an argument with somebody like me, you don't, know, you don't even know. And then I start in on this like, well, 
Aaron, I know how you are, and you're very, you know, you can be proud. And when you find out that you're wrong, <laughs> it's going to be hard on you. And because I love you, I don't want it to be hard on you. So you just got to say that you're wrong now. <laughs> and she's like, I'm not wrong. You're wrong. And I'm like, here, here we go. And then I'm like, don't make me do this. You know, it hurts my heart to do this because I love you so much. But when you get like this, you're just hard to be around. I'm like, don't make me get out my phone and Google it. And she's like, Google it. I'm like, don't make me do it, Aaron. It's just going to be so embarrassing for you. And I don't want to embarrass you. Believe me, the last thing I want to do is accuse her of shoplifting in a store one time, which happened. But I just never want to embarrass you. I just never want to. She goes through the lineup and I'm like, you should check her pockets. She likes to steal stuff. And then I got a lecture for like five minutes. I have a super angry lecture from the cashier. And I was rolling over. I was laughing so hard because she was so mad. She's like, she's going to get, she, the cops are going to come and she's going to, I'm like, please call the cops. That would be incredible. But I've never done, you know, in a past life. And I'm like, Aaron, this is going to be hard on your pride. And I know you and I don't, I care about you. Just say you're wrong. I'm like, I'm Googling it. Here I go, Aaron. Is this what you want? I'm Googling it. I'm going to hit send. Aaron, I'm going to, we're going to search it. She's like, search it. I'm like, don't make me do this. And then I search it. And 90% of these exchanges... This is what happens 100% of the time. <laughs> Just tell the truth. Just... This is what happens. You ready? This is what, this is what I do. Because in this situation, I just can't help myself. Then it's real quiet after I hit search. And it's real quiet. And Pastor Aaron, you all think that she's nice, but she uses the quiet spaces to manipulate my heart. <laughs> she just lets me stew in it for a little while. And then she finally just says, what did, what did Google say? And 100% of the time, I say this, Google couldn't find it. <laughs> and then I leave with my feelings hurt. <laughs> what is it that makes us so stuck? We just can't say it. We just can't say, I'm wrong. What an idiot. Can't believe I did that again. I do it every, like, every single time we have an argument about anything. I just can't. Why is it that the first thing that I say, I just got to stick to it. You know what we do is that we believe something that's wrong and then we internalize what's wrong. Well, we, we internalize our belief about it, but that's not right, which is also called a lie. And we internalize it. And then what happens in the relationship is the truth is that we're not trying to get the truth. When, when I have to admit that I'm wrong, why do I feel like I'm losing? Don't you think that a son of God ought to be able to say, hey, the truth came out. That's winning. I won because I said I was wrong. Yeah. Why can't it doesn't feel right? It hurts my heart. Somebody asked me, how's your heart? I'm like, it pumps blood. <laughs> it's not a question you ask an eight on the Enneagram. How's your heart? I'm like, functioning? <laughs> they meant, how are you emotionally? I'm like, maybe functioning? I don't, who would know? <laughs> don't hurt my feeling. Now, I, I had a, I had a, I had a four, <laughs> I had a foreman, I heard his feeling one time. He only had one of them and I heard it. But I, I had a foreman one time that he was like one of those habitual liars. He could not tell the truth. And, and every time you were in there, he would just make stuff up and, and then he would make up stuff about that person. And then I, I, would, I would hear, I would go in and I would hear about, I heard a story about Dan one time. And Dan's a great young guy who was working, he was starting to run sites. And I would walk out of there and I would call Dan on the phone and I'd be like, hey, guess what I just heard about you? And he's like, well, that's not even happening here. Why is he saying that? I'm like, I don't know. And then Dan's like, hey, guess what I heard about you yesterday? He just, the foreman, he just couldn't tell the truth. And one time this thing happened that you got to know it's, it's our reaction when we start internalizing lies and we start lying and we start, our nose starts growing. This is what happens. Some customer accused him of lying, which he 100% did. Like if you knew him, you'd just be like, 100% he did. Why would a random customer come in? And, and I was in the shop right after this happened. And he was livid. He was just furious. He's like, can you believe this guy said, called me a liar? I'm such a liar. He's like, and I'm thinking to myself, you know what I thought right in that moment? I'm like, he doesn't even know. Yeah. Yeah. He has no idea that everything that comes out of his mouth is made up. He doesn't even know. It scared me. I'm like, am I like that? Is there a part of my life that doesn't even know? Well, that's what happens in your life is that self, see, the devil will sell you a lie 
And then instead of teaming up with the truth against the part of you that wants to believe the lie, you believe the lie and then whoever's on your team who agrees with you is good and whoever's on the other side of the table is bad. But sometimes the person on the other side of the table is the spirit of God because he's truth. And it's not the truth winning out, it's you winning out. And whenever you win, you're happy and whoever doesn't agree with you is the bad person, is the villain. What if the villain is the Holy Spirit? Then things start getting a little weird. See, the devil wants you to swallow a lie so that the next step is called self-deception. That's when you tell yourself. That's when you deceive yourself. And if you deceive yourself, the devil doesn't even need to show up to the game anymore because you're doing it to yourself. And that's what happens. You sell yourself on the lie and then you keep telling it to yourself. And the devil doesn't even need to show up. You're doing his job for him. It's just bad practice. Let the devil do his job. Let him at least earn his keep. Don't do his job for him. This begins early in life. Can I share a parenting tip with you? This is how we built our home. It's hard to do and it takes a lot of courage because you got to do some surgery and surgery isn't fun. And you can't really care about people's emotions when you're doing surgery. Sometimes you got to get the cancer out. Can I hear an amen venue church? You ready? Put this up on the screen for me. At the hint of a falsehood, every, a child's world must stop. They will forfeit every good thing that follows a lie. At the hint of a falsehood, raising kids, at the very hint of it, all systems stop. Emergency stop. Dad's going to be late for work. All stop. Do not pass go. Go straight to jail. Do not collect $200. Stop. Stop. Everything has to stop. It's not that you broke a window. It's not that you punched your brother. If you lie, everything stops. No, don't let them go around punching windows and breaking brothers. But <laughs> the lying has to be the first stop. All systems stop. 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 We have some wise parents here. They're sitting right over there. I didn't ask their permission, so I'm not going to say their name on the... But they're sitting right there. <laughs> they said, one of our girls is starting to lie. And I'm like, bring her to the principal's office. Bring her for some heart surgery. I might bring her. And so if they sat her there and I, I warned them, I'm like, this is going to be a huge deal. We're going to make a huge deal of this. Okay, just go along with it. I like a little bit of drama sometimes. I'm like, this is going to be a huge deal. There's a reason why. Just trust me. And so we brought, we brought her in and I said, so your mom tells me you've been starting to tell some lies. She goes, yeah. And I said, okay, lying breaks relationship. It's the worst thing you can do. It breaks relationship. So I want you to turn and to tell your mom, look at your mom in the eye and say, I don't want a relationship with you. Pastor Corey, you big meanie. I said, tell her and then tell your dad, I don't want a relationship with you. She starts crying. I don't want a relationship with you. I'm going to say it. I don't want a relationship with you. Say it to dad. I don't want a relationship with you. Now tell your mom that you want to be the mom. I want to be the mom. I don't want you to be my mom anymore. I don't want you to be my dad anymore. You horrible monster. Well, it's that conversation or the one 20 years later when her husband comes in and is like, I'm done. Her own kids hate her because she won't tell the truth. I'm like, seven-year-old tears, that's okay, or however old she I'm like, but I'll tell you what, five minutes later, confession is good for the soul. And five minutes later, she's good. You know how it is when you do something that's really, I'm like, yeah, I'm proud of you. You did the right thing. Good job. Fist bump out of there. Come on. It's a, it'll shift a child's entire, everything good after that is going to come down if it's built on a lie in a child's life. Lying is the worst thing you can do. Don't ever tell a lie. And if you tell a lie, make it right. Make it right. Go back and dig down to the truth because the truth is what every relationship is built upon. I walked out of town one day and I grew up in a home that spoke the truth. I lied to my father one time and I remember him looking at me and how disappointed because you never, why would you tell a lie? I lied to him one time, never before, never since. And I just remember the sense that I had of just his shame of like, why? If you did something dumb, why would you lie about it? And I realized it takes no courage to tell a lie. It's the shortcut. And I don't need to, I need to have courage. I need to be strong. And when your child comes to you and confesses the truth, just keep your dang mouth shut and just let them talk. They're like, hey, we watched this thing on the laptop and we... Let them talk. And then afterwards be like, I am so proud of you for telling me the truth. That's what we do in this family. And that takes a lot of guts. 
Hey, we'll fix the other stuff, but you did the right thing, and I am, that's what strong kids do. Good job, sweetheart. Good, come on. I walked out of town one day, and I realized that I had some self-deception in my life. I had a secret. I had some sin that was hidden. You know, the first time you, when you sin, you got to tell yourself, well, sooner or later, you got to be like, well, everybody does it, you know. And then sooner or later, you kind of make a deal with the Holy Spirit, and you're like, well, you know, I'll just be extra nice for a month. Because that works. The trouble is if you make an unholy deal with the Holy Spirit, are you really talking to the Holy Spirit? And I walked out of town one day and I realized I'm not. Who am I talking to? Because it's not the real me and it's certainly not the real you. Because the real you is never okay with this sort of thing. And the Holy Ghost has brought his conviction upon me to turn my heart around. And I, you want to know why we're a Holy Ghost church? Because I walked out of town and I realized this thing goes so deep inside of my soul I just, I, and five minutes ago, I didn't even think it was a thing. And I'm like, oh boy, how deep does this go? And I walked out of town and I prayed for a month straight, two or three hours a day. And I didn't even pray in the English language. I prayed in the Holy Ghost. I prayed in tongues. Somebody needs to go through the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Alpha Group. Somebody needs to go through it and maybe dad needs to teach it again in his group. But I'll tell you what, I went and I prayed in the spirit for a month straight because I'm like, if I open my mouth, I could sell ice to Eskimos and I'm going to sell myself on who I think I am. And that's what lying does. It creates an image of you that you now project. To, and I create an image of myself that I project to Nassia and to Sean. And I'm like, hey, connect with this person because this person looks better than the real me. Connect with this person. And then sooner or later, we start feeling disconnected with each other because they're connecting with some image of me that's not even me. And then I'm like, why don't you love me? And they're like, but I love this? Well, you don't love me. Well, that's because they don't even know me. First Timothy four of these liars, Paul downloads something to a spiritual son, Timothy, you need to hear these liars have lied so long for so well. And for so long, they've lost their capacity for the truth. Wow. You met people like that. They don't even, they don't even know anymore. That word means like they have, they don't even know what they can't distinguish between good and bad. That's what it means. They've seared their conscience with a hot iron. You did it to yourself, though. Um, how could that happen in the life of a person? Have you ever seared your own conscience? Every time that you open your mouth and tell something that's not true, every time you tell a lie, you're actually taking an iron to your own conscience. And sooner or later, you don't even know what's good and what's bad anymore. Good is whatever you said. And bad is whoever disagrees. And it's terrifying to the people around you. They're like, well... Am I on your team? I love you, but I don't love that part of you. Do they have to love every part of you? Even the parts that you hate? Even the parts that you ought to hate about you? Do they have to love that too? Oh. Come on, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Now, can I judge Judy a little? She's been teaching me about, about liars. She spent, you know, she keep, tells everybody in there, I've been doing this for 4,000 years. Don't lie to me. She always says, liars don't, liars have to have a good memory because they always got to remember what they said. She said she can always tell when somebody's telling a lie because they tell the story the same way that they told it the last time. And every time that she keeps at them, they just keep using the same words in the same order because they're not, you ready? Liars don't access memory. I've been learning about this. They don't access memory. You ready? This is the tough part. Ready? Ready? They create false ones. So they say something and that becomes in their mind what actually happened, but it's not. I had somebody one time overhear me say something to my wife and say, did you say this to your wife? And I'm like, Hey, why are you listening to a conversation with me and my wife? Cause I thought it was the two in front of God and I don't feel like your name is in there. And then they, they proceeded to, they overheard me say something and they said, did you say this? And I said, no, I didn't say that. And then they proceeded to give me heck for something I didn't say because they thought that I did, but I just told them I didn't. And now you're giving me heck for it. It gets real confusing. All respect. This is, they don't access, this is scary. You ready? If you tell yourself a lie, you're not accessing a memory. Because when a child tells a memory, when you tell a memory of like the birthday party that you were at when you were allowed to. <laughs> Too soon. 
you don't tell the story the same way every time. Then you're like, oh yeah, and so-and-so was there, and she was wearing a red shirt. No, was it red? Maybe it was. And then, see, when you access memory, your eyes go to a certain place, you're actually trying to remember what actually happened. But a liar doesn't do that. They say something, and that becomes their memory. Imagine how frightening this is to argue with you, spouse. You're like, well, you said that. And they're like, no, I didn't. And I certainly didn't say it that way. And then you, and then you, then you say like, well, you made me feel that way. And they're like, what's happening? <laughs> Are you, is somebody filming this for TV? <laughs> well, you made me feel that way. Listen, unless you're four, nobody can make you feel anything anymore. You make you feel things. Take control. Give it to the Holy Ghost. Come on, venue church. Then nobody can make you do something and make you feel something. And like, well, and then we go into this like, well, yeah, but I felt threatened. And so that's why I told a lie. Well, you were angry and I was scared. So that's why I told a lie. What does somebody else have to do with you telling a lie? They put a gun to your head, did they? Well, it felt like it. And your poor spouse is like, what are we talking about? You know what they did? Go back to the Garden of Eden. You remember, God comes to Adam and he's like, Adam, like, bro, tell me what happened. And Adam's like, oh man, I screwed up so bad. Oh, please forgive me so I don't mess up my kids and their grandkids and Chad's life and his kid's life. Like, I'm so, I don't want to mess everything up. Please forgive me. I have this all on me. Y'all think that's what happened? <laughs> I'm just making that up. That didn't happen. Y'all need to read your Bibles and access memory. This is what he said. God's like, what happened? And Adam's like, you know what he says? The woman you gave me <laughs> fed me an apple. <laughs> so I guess this is on you. <laughs> Ooh, that's what lying does. Oh no, I have every right to lie because you ain't got nothing to do with, got nothing to do with them. And he comes to Eve. I mean, he sold her for an apple. Eve must have looked good naked. Because I'm saying, like, for an apple? A hamburger? I get that. Come on, venue church. This is why people leave the church. Pastor says stuff he shouldn't say. Mm. Somebody had to say you were thinking it. And then he comes to Eve, and he's like, Eve, what happened? And she's like, the snake deceived me. And I'm not like... I don't know what I was thinking. I was talking to a snake. If he's a snake when you dated him, he's going to be a snake after you marry him. What were you dating a snake for? You know, she doesn't be like, oh, this is a wild. I don't know. Why was I talking to a snake? Why would you talk to a snake? The only thing snakes are good for is like, snakes are evil, man. They're the devil. Why would you have a snake in your house? Why would one day you find a snake between your mattresses? Quinn Canfield. I'm going to move on. Hey, this... What we're saying is, this is not my problem and this is not my fault, it's your fault and I feel justified and that's what I'm gonna do. So, 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 you ready? Every time that you lie, you paint this, if I lie to Chad, this is what I do, I paint this, this on a rock, I paint, you're stupid. And then I hand it to him. Here, carry that around. I think you're stupid. If you don't call me out, you're gonna be, the worst thing in Canada is to not be called mean. Right, so Chad, he's gonna listen to me tell a story about Shannon over here, and he knows that it's not true, and he's not gonna call me on it, and so I just paint this on a rock and say, you're stupid. Because every child that tells a lie to his mom that mom doesn't call on, every child thinks they're smarter than mom. You think you're smarter than the people you lie to, that's why you, you do it all the time. And then I paint like, hey, I'm in charge, and then I hand that to him too. And then I go and talk to Shannon about Chad over here, and I'm like, hey, I define the rules of this relationship. And I make her carry that around. And pretty soon your, your teenager is carrying 300 rocks around that they never agreed to carry around. And I'll tell you, when they drop the rocks, then the person who's been doing all the lying and breaking all the relationship gets mad. Why did you break the relationship? And they're like, I'm not supposed to carry your rocks. I'm, you think I'm stupid? You're in charge. You're more important. You get to define the rules. Why shouldn't the truth define the rules of an argument? Okay, you ready? You ready? Here's how you know somebody has a problem in lying. Did they, in the middle of an argument, when they've realized that they're wrong, did they stop and lose the argument voluntarily so that the truth can win? You ready? Here goes the cold water. A humble person 
doesn't hear that like I just said it. Because if the devil can get you to focus on somebody else being a liar, a humble person is sitting here and they're like, wait, so they, so if they don't stop an argument in the middle when they hear the truth and lose the argument for the sake of the truth, and they're like, they, pastor's not preaching to they, pastor's preaching to me. He means me, doesn't he? He's talking about me. See, a humble person internalizes the lesson, always internalizes it first. But a, a liar won't. And so if you want to confront lying in your child, you know what you have to do? You've got to confront it in yourself first. Come on. It, it's like, hey, Johnny, like you, you, wait, how many? No. Your teacher said what? I don't think your teacher, let's call your teacher on the telephone right now. Before you take your moral high horse and do that, you've got to be like, wait a minute. Did I do this at work the other day? Because if you want the Holy Ghost, then you've got to get the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth. And you're like, hey, what's well, so respect your mother? Come on, teenage moms of teenagers, you respect your mother. Wait a minute, do I respect my too close, too close to home? Okay. Maybe you gotta apply it to yourself. A humble person always applies the lesson to themselves first. Always, 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 always. If Adam had done it, you wouldn't be here. Well, not that here's not like a bad place, it's church so <laughs> I'm glad that you're here here, but you wouldn't be in the mess of sin that got you here. So maybe there's that. <laughs> Now, here's what you got to do as I get into the scripture. Now, the scripture is going to kind of close this up and tie it all off. You're going to leave here feeling good and strong and confident. We're going to sing a song called Jaira, which means God is enough and God is bigger than all of this. And, but here's what you got to do. Next step. You ready this week? Just try to stay out of situations where you tend to lie. Stay out of those situations. You've got to change the game. If you get confronted, you know that you make up something on the spot. So here's what I want you to do. Next time you're confronted, don't say anything. Just be like... Bathroom break. <laughs> Literally do it and run. Bathroom break. I used to do this in high school when I was feeling like tempted or something like that. I would just go into the bathroom and close the stall. I wouldn't do anything. I just need to pray a little bit. Be like, time out. Bathroom break. Or I'm like, snack. You don't want to talk to me when I'm like this. I'm hangry. <laughs> just give me a minute. Just give me a minute. Because I, I want it to be the real me that speaks next. And I don't want it to be the other thing that's crazy. Yeah. So just, can I come back in five minutes? I promise you, I just... You'll, you'll like me better in five minutes. And then you go back and you're like, okay, what's the truth? And then you come back with it. You come back rather in its pocket rather than carrying it around in your pocket and dropping it sometimes. All right, now Acts chapter five, it says, but a man named Ananias, his wife Sapphira, don't call your kids Ananias and Sapphira, please, conniving in this with him. It's like calling your kid Jezebel. Maybe that's like a thing from another culture. Like if your kids, there's 10 Jezebels here. I call my kid Jezebel. It's just a weird name. Okay. You can't distract me. His wife, Sapphira, conniving in this with him, sold a piece of land, secretly kept back part of the price for himself, and then brought the rest of, to the apostles and made an offering of it. Well, that's a pretty great deal. Like, he sold a piece of land, and they, made, they brought 80% to the apostles, and they're like, here, do something awesome in the world with it. Let's get the gospel. Let's feed people, you know. And, um, but what you don't know maybe is that Barnabas had just done this. A man named Barnabas is kind of on the scene in the church now. And he had sold a field and took the whole thing and brought it in. He's like, here's all of it. Just, man, I love you. I love what we're doing. This is, what could be better than a gift in this direction? And Ananias and Sapphira over here. And they're like, we want a piece of that. Because everybody in the church is like, Barnabas is incredible. Can you believe what he did? Oh my goodness, this Barnabas, what an amazing, they call him the son of encouragement. They're like, wow, he did, wow, that's incredible. And they're like, Ananias and Sapphira are like, we want people to think that way about us. And this is what lying is. They sold a piece of property and they brought a portion, but they said it was all. And this is what lying is. A liar never brings all of it to the table, but they want you to treat them like they do. And if you're a liar, you have rooms that nobody even knows about that you have. And you don't bring it all to the table and the people that live with you can feel it and you can feel it and you feel guilty about it because you're not bringing all of you to the table. You're not bringing all of you to the party. You have a reserve gas tank that's all yours and they don't even know about. And so they, they bring a bit of themselves to the table. Peter said, Ananias, how did Satan get to you, you to lie to the Holy Spirit and secretly keep back part of the price of the field? He's like, before you sold it, you could have brought a portion back or nothing. He's like, it was yours to do with. Like, you know this is not the tithe. This is like, hey, you, like, you do whatever you want. But don't come and bring a part and say it's all. He said, what got into you? You didn't lie to men, but to God. Ananias, when he heard those words, fell down dead. If you didn't know that was in the Bible, you need to read your Bible. Because the Bible's weird. 
Can you imagine Pastor Peter sitting in his office? And his assistant walks in. Knock, knock, walks in. Hey, uh, Pastor, you asked me to remind you about... (laughs) Did you have something you wanted to tell me? (laughs) Pastor. There's There's a dead body in Peter's office. That put the fear of God into everybody who heard it. Uh huh. Was that the Holy Ghost or was that Peter? Because we didn't even hear anything. How did he do it? Is it Darth Vader? Like, <laughs> the younger men went right to work and wrapped him up, then carried him out and buried him. You know, as, as with everybody, when we get caught lying, the exposure of the lie is worse to us than the initial sin. And it's a shock. It's a huge shock. Just be prepared for that. But it's good for your soul. Not more than three, unless you die, then that's not good for your soul. Not more than three hours later, his wife, knowing nothing of what had happened, came in. Ann and I just didn't have find my iPhone on. So she's like, why have you been at the cemetery for three hours? That's weird. You got to think about the Bible like it actually happened. I want everybody here to turn on and find my friends because I want to know where you are when I text you, Sean. I'm always kind of curious, like, where is he? Because it would change the tone of my text sometimes. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm not going to turn mine on because that's gross. He said, uh, Peter said, tell me, were you given the price for this field? She said, yes, that price. Peter responded, what's going on here that you connive to conspire against the spirit? They're like, no, but we just lied to you, but there's no difference. The men who buried your husband were at the door and you're next. No sooner were the words out of his mouth. She also fell down dead. When the young men returned, they found her body. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And then the guy carrying the shovels was like, I'm not carrying him back this time. Because if, if this was going to happen, Peter should have told us, and I don't want to carry a bunch of shovels around if I don't need to. That was so funny. It was a powerful joke. By this time, the, the whole church, and in fact, everybody who heard of these things, had a healthy respect for God. They knew God was not to be trifled with. Let God do a little surgery on your heart. Hold the truth up in the highest esteem in your relationships because when you do, you are respecting God. And here's the deal with God is he is not afraid of your enemies in any way. God can fix anything. God can heal anything. God can remove any pain and torment from your past. God can do it, but without a respect for God, who are you going to get to do it? Here's, here's the thing. The first lie the devil wants you to believe, Renee, is that if you would tell Scott everything about you, that he wouldn't love you anymore. And that's what we're afraid of. And we say, well, they don't. And then, so then what happens is you decide for them that they couldn't love you. Or maybe you decide that they wouldn't even try to love you. And that's not fair to do to a person. Because if I sin against him by lying to him and I don't tell him what I need to tell him, then I'm deciding for him, hey, if I told you the real thing about me, you wouldn't love me. And I don't even give him the chance. But you know what love does? Love has the courage to let you decide about me. But here's who I really am. Now, somebody in this world needs to know everything about you because the Bible says, confess your sins to God for forgiveness and to each other for healing. And some of you are walking around with old wounds and old poison and old sicknesses inside of your body, inside of your heart, inside of your mind. Too much fear, too much anger, too much. And God can't heal you because you just won't tell somebody about you. But then let them decide about you. And even if they don't love you, God would. And the people of God, I think, would be like, I admire somebody who tells the truth. And if you knew the truth about me, you wouldn't be worried about you. The reason I walked out of town that day was because Pastor Craig Rochelle in a conference said these words. He said, if you confess your sins right now, God will restore you. But if you wait till you get caught, you'll lose everything. And I'm like, I don't want to lose everything. And I sweated for a few days, but I got it out. That's why I had to go out. And I realized there's great grace in the house of God. You got to come boldly to the throne of grace to ask God for mercy and help in time of need. God is Jehovah Jireh. He's bigger than it. He's bigger than your lie. He's bigger than anything that you're afraid of happening. If that lie comes out, God can fix it. God can restore. God can heal. Come on, venue church. Let's sing sing Jireh.